And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Michael Murray, who's going to be discussing a case of unilateral blurry vision and headache. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want everyone to know that he looks amazing this morning, and that's despite being woken up by me at 6 a.m. in the call room when he was a little disoriented sitting up on the couch wondering what was happening. So you clean up well, Mike. You look good. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so I'll be discussing a case of unilateral blurry vision and headache. Um, unlike other presenters, I don't have financial disclosures. Maybe I wish that I did at this point, but I do not. Um, so this was a patient who came in with a right eye blurry vision and headache, a 78-year-old male, uh, had a past medical history of polymyalgia rheumatica, a cabbage in 20, uh, 2007, and then diabetes, and presented to a rheumatology clinic with about a week history of right eye blurry vision, um, was described as you know, blurry throughout the eye without flashes or floaters, and then an associated headache uh, described as unilateral and frontal. Uh, with some mild associated jaw pain. Uh, there was no recent illness or other systemic symptoms, and past medical history and ocular history were pretty non-contributory other than uh, stated here. Um, he was on prednisone, 10 milligrams daily, and aspirin, um, had a penicillin allergy, um, and then a former smoker who had a 50-pack year history. So at this point in the rheumatology clinic, the differential was quite broad, um, including vascular causes, GCA, NAON, um, infectious inflammatory causes as listed, um, neoplastic autoimmune. The, the point of this slide is that the, the differential was or should have been quite broad. Um, the patient was told by the rheumatologist to increase his steroid dose to 30 milligrams per day and then was sent home. And two days later came back to the emergency department uh, had a worsening headache, headache, and at this time he had a mild ptosis in that right eye and some right facial numbness, uh, and also severe right-sided facial and forehead and retroorbital pain, um, and still had this blurry vision. And a temporal artery with biopsy was arranged at that time and taken, and then he was told by the ED after consultation with rheumatology to increase the prednisone to 60 milligrams per day and sent home. And then two days after that, so four days after his initial presentation and almost two weeks after the symptoms started, he came back to the emergency department for progression of his symptoms and pain. And meanwhile, the biopsy for GCA has come back negative. Mike, was he already on the 10 milligrams of prednisone before this? Chronically was on it for the polymyalgia rheumatic. Thank you. Uh, so his visual acuity in that right eye was NLP at this time. Um, he had an unreactive five millimeter pupil uh, he had an APD by reverse, um, and then on extraocular movements, he was fixed in the right eye, and the left eye had an abduction deficit. Uh, pressure was normal, and his visual fields uh, were normal in the left eye, and then he didn't have vision in the right eye, obviously. Um, so on bedside exam, he had moderate proptosis in the right eye and a complete ptosis. Um, and mild fullness of the right upper and lower lids. Um, he had a corneal uh, epithelial defect without infiltrate. Otherwise, you know, AC iris lens exam, relatively normal. And on his dilated exam, the optic nerve didn't show any signs of edema or pallor. There was no hemorrhage or ischemia visible. Uh, cranial nerve exam kind of summed up the only other thing besides the NLP vision and the uh, ophthalmoplegia of the right eye uh, was also a decreased sensation in the V1 distribution of the right side. Otherwise, cranial nerves were normal. So this is a photograph of him just uh, demonstrating that right eye ophthalmoplegia and the left eye abduction deficit here. So selected lab exams, he had an elevated white count. Um, he had an LP performed, the uh, PCR came back for strep pneumo on his CMP, uh, <coughs> demonstrated metabolic anion gap acidosis. PT, PTT were within normal limits and his A1C was 14.5. So working differential at this point, um, obviously thinking about vascular causes, septic emboli, cavernous sinus thrombosis, infectious causes, um, he has you know, so events of bacterial meningitis, bacterial fungal invasive disease, neoplastic autoimmune, obviously a little bit lower down at this point. And I just wanted to talk uh, just a quick kind of learning point about uh, temporal arteritis, since this was kind of uh, an anchored diagnosis in this case. Uh, looking in the literature, it can exhibit multiple cranial nerve signs. It's pretty rare to have it be bilateral. Um, and 
you know, here's a couple of isolated cases, but they're kind of case reports. And especially seeing a, you know, facial nerve, or sorry, a, a V1 distribution sensory nerve, uh, and also abduction deficits, a uh, little uh, unusual. Um, and then I liked uh, this quote, it's uh, Sherlock Holmes, he says, I make a point of never having any prejudices and of following docilely where fact may lead me. And in an outside hospital, there was an astute ID doc as this patient was admitted and being worked up for some meningitis concerns who thought that the facts might lead him to look here. So this is a photo that we actually obtained when the patient uh, was transferred to us uh, showing black uh, discoloration of the right palate. And then here's some other imaging. So on the left hand side, this is an MRI post contrast T1 image showing that superior ophthalmic vein and there's a thrombosis there. Also on the right image, there's evidence of uh, occlusion of the right petrosal vein. These images are also MRI post-contrast T1 images uh, showing an infiltrative disease involving the right orbit and then extending to the right cavernous sinus. And then here's a post-contrast T2 uh, image showing also that involvement in the right cavernous <coughs> sinus. So I wanted to talk a little bit about orbital apex syndrome and superior orbital fissure syndrome. Um, Basically, the biggest difference between this is how far back uh, compression is occurring. So the orbital apex syndrome is uh, involving cranial nerve 2, and I like this anatomical diagram here as a, a view looking towards the orbit, and then superior orbital fissure syndrome is a little bit more anterior, uh, spares the optic nerve and is common, uh, commonly trauma-related. Um, and then cavernous sinus. Um, so the anatomy of it, it's a complex network of vein, lots of septations in there, and a one by two centimeter cavity. Uh, drains blood from the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins, as well as sphetoparietal sinus and the superior and inferior cerebral veins. And the two sides are connected by an intracavernous sinus. I like that lower di diagram that shows uh, the space that contains, you know, cranial nerve three, four, uh, five and six and the internal carotid artery and it also shows great proximity to the sphenoid sinuses and the roof um, of the palate. So cavernous sinus syndrome first described by Richard Bright in 1831 he actually had uh, two volume sets of renal disease and then cerebrovascular disease has these remarkable drawings you can buy a first edition online for like twenty thousand dollars if you want um, and there's three types that have then been described, and it's basically anatomically how far back the uh, cavernous sinus is involved, posterior being uh, all uh, branches of that trigeminal nerve, whereas anterior is just V1 and middle is V1 and V2. Uh, common causes continuous spread from nasal fruncal, the sphenoidal ethmoidal sinuses, and dental disease, and the pathogens are listed there. Uh, staph and strep, obviously common, and then uh, less common, ground negative rods, fungal, and mucor. Uh, there's also aseptic causes, trauma, malignancy, uh, dehydration, anemia, or granulomatous disease. So this is a uh, histopathology of uh, this patient's palatal biopsy, a representative photo here showing the septated uh, hyphae there, and then also the staining on GMS. So I want to talk a little bit about mucormycosis. Uh, described first actually in 1885 by Richard Palaf. He was a medical forensic uh, professor in Prague. And then actually didn't uh, really get much uh, attention in the literature until about the 1940s. Uh, vascularly invasive, it's part of the zygomycosis family, commonly rise with mucor. And has affinity not just for the uh, rhino orbital tract, but pulmonary and GI tracts as well. Um, it's associated with diabetes, uh, especially DKA, which our patient happened to have, uh, as well as being immunocompromised either from medications or uh, malignancy causing neutropenia, et cetera. And uh, the initial presentation is similar to our, our patient with the headache, sinusitis, and then some visual changes. The cavernous sinus symptoms, which can spread to the other eye, and that's actually you know, what was happening in this patient is that they were spread along that intracavernous sinus causing the left abduction deficit. Uh, treatments for mucormycosis, uh, obviously you got to stop the uh, fire that's stoking the flame, so uh, getting rid of any immunomodulatory therapy as quick as you can, taper it down, uh, correcting the metabolic derangements, so DK in this case, um, and then an IV antifungal uh, 
commonly out the Tercin B at five to seven and a half mix per kick per day. And then the aggressive surgical debridement is just really paramount and causing the source control. Other therapies that are actually being looked at as adjunctive therapy, and I'm sad that Dr. Patel couldn't be here today, but he actually published a case report uh, where they were able to save an eye from exoneration using intraorbital irrigation of amphotericin B in um, kind of concert with these other therapies. There's also a case report uh, for retrobulbar inject injections of amphotericin B. Hyperbaric oxygen has been shown also to be uh, kind of another adjunct therapy that people have been interested in. And then another therapy that people have looked at is iron chelation. Uh, Defiracerox was in this defeat myocard trial and unfortunately that didn't show any benefit. And the difficulty in all of these therapies is really coming up with any um, meaningful amount of patients that you can get at a single center because mucomycosis is relatively rare. And so finding the end size to be able to power a study to show significance is difficult, but there's uh, more studies that need to be done. So the follow-up for our patient, uh, the clinical course, unfortunately, after uh, extensive consult with uh, neurosurgery and ENT and ID, the decision was made not to perform surgery. He had extensive involvement um, to the skull base, and they didn't think that the morbidity of the surgery uh, was able to justify doing surgery in his case and that they'd be able to clear the affected tissue. So palliative care was consulted and the amphotericin B was actually continued but other comfort care measures were taken and the patient was transferred back to Montana for his end of life care. So these are my references. Just wanted to thank Dr. Patel, uh, Dr. Marks, and Tina Manlis actually helped out with this case a bunch. And as an ode to summer, I'm sad that's over. This is some of my fun, favorite summer activities at Bear Lake, um, and then I'm happy to take some any questions. Uh, some pictures of the fam.